بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله. So today we begin with Hadith number three. قال رضي الله عنه ونفعنا بعلوم فضرين آمين. So Imam Al Nawawi he adds this Hadith number three uh, on the authority of Abu Abd Rahman Abdullah, the son of Umar ibn Al Khattab رضي الله عنه who said. I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Islam has been built on five pillars, testifying that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu performing the prayers, paying the zakah, making the pilgrimage to the house and the fasting the Ramadan. It was related by Bukhari and Muslim. So uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was one of the companions known for his extreme worship and obedience uh, or not extreme is a bad word but his intense worship and obedience to the point that he used to walk around medina and he would mark places on the ground with like a type of tar where the prophet was known to pray here and pray there and some of the people that are responsible for renewing the construction of the mosque in medina they found over you know recently that when they dug up some of the ground to do groundwork, they found some of those original markings. So he was somebody very close to uh, the Prophet ﷺ in trying to emulate him, etc. In, in addition to being the son of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Now this hadith, we don't have to spend so much time on it because we talked about this part of the hadith in the previous hadith, which is the longer version. But it's important for us to mention that we do have this standalone hadith. So there's, it's not like a, a redundancy that Imam al nawawi includes this hadith because these acts, these five acts are the collectively are what constitute our faith practice. So if we leave one of these, we have not completed our faith. We have not completed our obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the Khilafah of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, for example, radiallahu anhu, there were groups of Arab tribes that refused to pay the zakah. And the Prophet and Sayyidina Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, he raised an army to fight them. In the books of Islamic history, they're called uh, Hurub al ridda the, the wars of uh, apostasy. Because leaving, you know, off paying the zakah is one of these pillars. Without it, there is no Islam. So if somebody denies, you know, somebody says the shahada, but somebody denies prayer, for example. It's a very long debate in Islamic law about if the person, the Muslim who doesn't pray, if that act of non-praying takes them outside of Islam or not. Of course, the issue, this is an important issue that I raise it because this is what the Daesh people say. The Daesh people, they say that Muslims that don't pray are kuffar and then you can kill them. I've met some of these people, by the way. And they confuse the issue that the fuqaha, they say, the jurists, they say, if somebody leaves the prayer because they're lazy, it's one thing. And if somebody leaves the prayer saying that there is no prayer, it's something else. So the people in Islamic law that say the people that don't pray, that takes them outside of Islam, meaning that they deny that the prayer is part of the faith. Just like if somebody said, uh, alcohol, drinking alcohol is something that is fundamental to Islam. That's very different than a Muslim saying, I know I shouldn't drink, but I drink. See, there are two different things. The person who says that alcohol is halal and denies that it's haram, they deny something that is evidential, basically known from the religion. What we say, ma'lumun min ad bid darura. By necessity, every Muslim knows that Muslims don't drink alcohol. Every Muslim knows that we pray five times a day. So if somebody denies something like that, that could take them outside of Islam. Of course, the process of taking people out of Islam, I should also say, is a process of the courts. It's not a process for you know, individual people that do that. This is something that goes to the Qadi. But the people that don't pray because they're lazy or they don't pay the zakat because they forget, these people don't, are not taken outside of Islam. We talked about this hadith and the five pillars and Islamic law. So we'll go to the next hadith, inshallah. On the authority of Abdul Rahman Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhuma, who said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, and he is the truthful, the beloved. 
Verily, the creation of each one of you is brought together in his mother's belly for 40 days in the form of a seed. Then he is a clot of blood for a like period, then a morsel of flesh for a like period. Then there is sent to him the angel who blows the breath of life into him and who is commanded about four matters. To write down his means of livelihood, his lifespan, his actions, and whether happy or unhappy. Happy or unhappy meaning in the hereafter. By Allah, other than whom there is no God, verily one of you behaves like the people of paradise until there is but an arm's length between him and it. And that which has been written over takes him. And so he behaves like the people of the hellfire and thus he enters it. And one of you behaves like the people of hellfire until there is but an arm's length between him and it and that which has been written over him and that which has been written overtakes him. And so he behaves like the people of paradise and thus enters it. It's narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. Okay, this hadith, there are two main parts to this hadith. The first part of this hadith is the embryological stages that occur in these 40 day time periods. And then the second part of the hadith is this idea of things that are written for us. So we'll, we'll take them like that. This hadith, as you saw, is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. So in the world of hadith, if you remember sort of the first class and a little bit of the second class, this is the highest rank a hadith can have, that it is both in Bukhari and Muslim. And then the hadith that are in Bukhari and then the hadith that are in Muslim. Meaning that this is a very sound narration and this is something that we pay attention to. Now, the issue of the embryological stages is a huge debate in Islamic law. Why? Because based on our understanding of when the soul is placed in the body, based on that are all of a host of legal issues. For example, what happens if a woman miscarries after the soul is placed in the body? Is the miscarriage, miscarried fetus washed, shrouded, and buried and preyed upon or not? Second, does the woman have to enter into the uh, the, the nifas period, uh, the the postnatal bleeding period, or not? And then there are issues of inheritance. There are issues of of blood ties, etc. So this is not just an, you see how the issue in this country about abortion flattens the issue to black and white. Everything here just becomes black and white. You're with me or you're against me. You're blue or you're red. You're black or you're white. For us, it's not like that. It's nuanced. So this is not just an issue of abortion. Of course, this hadith is the hadith that the Hanafis and the Shafi's, some of the Shafi's use to demonstrate that abortion is permissible up until 120 days. Why? Because before 120 days, as the hadith states, after the third 40 days, then there is sent to the, to the fetus, the angel who blows the breath of life, which is not the best translation, but what is it in Arabic? The soul is then placed. After the soul is placed in the body, now this becomes a person. The proof of, then there are all of these other things that are written for the child, their light will, which we'll get to in a moment. Before that, the fuqaha that advocate, or the fuqaha that opine, I should say rather, the abortion opinion, is that this growth, this fetal growth, is a type of vegetation or you know, organic growth without the soul. Now, one of the problems with the embryological stuff in the Quran and also in uh, the ayah in Surah Al-Hajj, like I think the ayah two or three or four, the first few verses of Surah Al-Hajj, there's also these embryological stages that are mentioned. The fuqaha, they used to, uh, use medical resources and medical uh, manuscripts and medical writing and medical science to explain these things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem with that is that science is not going to tell us when the soul comes into the body. This is not something that we can see or perceive. So I have read people that advocate the anti-abortion stance according to Islamic law, try to use Islamic, uh, try to use modern medicine or modern embryology to determine that this hadith does not mean 40 plus 40 plus 40, 
but that all three of these takes place in the 40 days. Okay, maybe, I mean, I'm not an embryo embryologist. Maybe from an embryo embryology point of view, that's the truth. But the science is not going to tell us there's no you know, scan that says, oh, there's the soul that went in or it went out. It doesn't work like that. This is an act of, uh, uh, an article of belief. Obviously, I'm, I'm trying to give victory to my opinion. I'm not going to argue the other school's opinion, but I have to be faithful to that there are differences of opinion. Uh, actually, uh, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, who's a famous um, Hanbali scholar, jurist, and, and he has written one of the most extensive commentaries on this book, which I consult before teaching, he, he totally trashes that opinion. He says, well, daif. it's a very weak opinion. Yeah, it's not weak, it's just he doesn't like it because he has a different interpretation. So uh, people asked about abortion not too long ago, and this is the hadith that we were referencing, that abortion is permissible. Now, there are differences of opinion. But the modern fatwa, the fatwa that we give and that we hold to is that abortion is permissible up until 120 days. Uh, that doesn't mean that it uh, should be done without thought or without consideration. But from the moral point of view, there is no sin, uh, inshallah. There are other narrations. So the, I have to also mention that the other schools that reduce the time period, there's another narration, for example, that the soul is placed uh, 40 days plus 10 days, so at 50 days. That narration is not as strong as this narration. So this is where the strength of the hadith will impact the type of rulings that we deduce from it. Okay, so we don't need to delve into that. I think you sort of understand that there's a difference of opinion and, and, and whatnot. The other part of the hadith which is significant for us is this issue of what happens after the soul is placed in the body, that all of these things are written. Right? The first thing he says is his means of livelihood, his rizq what this child is going to do and what they are going to earn. The lifespan, when this person will die or how long they will live. Their actions, all of the things that they're gonna end up doing. And then whether they will be eternally happy or unhappy. So you can read this and you can say, well, what's the point of me doing anything if everything is predetermined? And this is a common like trap that people get into. You know, why should I do anything if Allah has written for me anything and everything? Well, number one, we don't know what has been written for us. We don't know what, what we're going to do. So from our perspective, we're free. We're doing the things that we need to be doing and we're deciding. But what this hadith is telling us is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we are going to do. And that's the key to understanding free will and predetermination, which has never really been a problem for Muslims uh, until the modern age, because there are all of these other ideas out there that sort of co-mingle. And uh, a lot of Muslims have like a syncretic idea of certain beliefs. But traditionally, this wasn't an issue because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not confined by time. There's no time for God. There's no yesterday, today, and tomorrow for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah sees everything as one moment. So therefore, in that uh, God perspective, if you could say, Allah Ta'ala sees what we're going to do and when so-and-so is going to die and when so, what so-and-so is going to do. But Allah is not making the person do that. That's the key. But rather Allah Ta'ala is creating the ability for that person to do that. So we say that nothing can happen except that Allah allows it to happen. So me sitting here and, and teaching and speaking and lecturing means that Allah Ta'ala has created this ability and I have acquired this ability to do it, to do this. Which means also had Allah Ta'ala not willed, even though I desire to do something, no matter what, I will not be able to do it. I desire to lift the car. I really want to lift the car, but I can't because Allah Ta'ala has not created that ability for me. But there are instances, you know, when adrenaline kicks in and there are people that are able to do physically unexplainable things. So from our theological point of view, we say because Allah Ta'ala has created the ability for that person to do that. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala therefore has rights for, the, for, the, for each one of us, what we're going to do, how we're going to make it, how much we're going to make, where we're going to go, the decisions that we're going to do, where we're going to die, how long we are going to live, all of that's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And most importantly, for the purposes of this hadith, is that last part, whether the person will be happy or unhappy, Sa'idun aw shaqi, meaning eternally. Is this person going to paradise or is this person going to the hellfire? 
And then the Prophet he said something even more startling. He said, the person who is going to hellfire, they might be the person who looks like in their lifetime, they are the person of Jannah. They're doing everything right. They're praying, they're fasting, they're charitable, etc. But then their kitab, what has been written for them, what has been ordained for them, kicks in. So they might do one thing towards the path of hellfire, and then they die like that. So in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-A'malu bil khawatimiha. Are the, the, what happens at the end of life has is a foretelling of what our resurrection will be like. And that's why one of the du'as we make is husn al-khitam. We ask for a good ending. And why it's a sunnah when you go visit sick people or people that are dying or on their deathbed. You, you know, you don't come to them with, with uh, nonsense. You come and you encourage them. You, you read Quran for them. You, you make them say the shahada. You, you make them do dhikr. You make them listen to Quran because you want that when they die, they die in the best state possible. And then the Prophet ﷺ said the opposite. He said there can be a bad person. They're doing everything wrong in this world. But Allah has written for them that they be a person of paradise. And then at the right, right at the moment of their death, they do one thing towards the path of Jannah and they die. And then they are resurrected with the people of Jannah. So one lesson for this is that we can't really judge one another. Because we don't know who amongst us is going this way or going that way. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may we all be the people of Jannah, inshallah. But ultimately, we don't know. So when we see people that are, um, you know, we would maybe commonly say are not good people or are not doing good things, let's say, it's very easy for us to want to pass judgment. And to say, oh, these are bad people and we're not like them and we're better than them, which leads to arrogance, which can take you down the wrong path. Because you don't know that that person who you are going to meet, what their end is going to be like. I think I told you guys the story about the, uh, uh, the guy who converted through opium. Right, we've shared the story before. There's this guy. Uh, this is a story from Sheikh Hamza. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. There's a guy who um, he, he was into drugs. And he was told, look, the best opium, if you really want to get high, you have to smoke opium. And the best opium is in Afghanistan. So, okay, so he went to, he got a cut a ticket, he went to Afghanistan, he found an opium, I think it's called den, opium den, opium house or cafe, whatever, and he was smoking away, and you know, as he's getting high and smoking away, he hears like this very melodious sound coming from next door. So when he comes to, he goes to see what this sound is, you know, he thinks it's like some type of traditional music and it just sounds really beautiful, and he finds an old man sitting reading the Quran. So he's like, oh man, this music is pretty cool. And I really want to, I really want to, uh, can you teach me how to sing the song? And he's like, okay, okay, but you have to you know, stop the pipe and you can't come in here with that. So the man sobers up and he learns to read the Quran and he becomes Muslim, right? So this man, his whole goal in life was to get high off of, off of the highest grade opium he could find. And that led him to Islam, Right? So these are stories, are, we have, we're replete with these stories. I mean, everyone has a story like this, of somebody who was good who turned out bad, and somebody who was bad who was turned out good. So we don't know what will happen. And when the companions asked the Prophet ﷺ upon hearing this hadith, so should we like not do anything? And he said, He said, all of you have to act because Allah has given you the capacity to do the things that have been written for you to do. But we don't know what those things are. So we keep trying and we keep working and we keep praying and we keep giving and we keep trying to improve ourselves. Hoping, inshallah, that we are from the people of paradise. Now, if you read a hadith like this, and if you think, oh, this is nonsense, and you're not listening to anything that we're saying, and you're like, okay, I'm not going to do anything anyway. Well, that's also from what was written for you. So this is not a hadith that's supposed to scare us, but rather it's very liberating. That inshallah, uh, my, you know, the fact that I've been guided, the fact that I'm here, the fact that I'm, you know, a person of faith, that I say the kalima, you know, la ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, inshallah we're amongst these, these people. So we're going to keep doing. But you have to keep your guard up, you have to keep doing the work. You have to keep your prayer, you have to keep your fast, you have to pay your zakah, you have to try to go to your hajj. You have to be good to your parents. You have to be good to your you know, community, etc. You have to keep going. It's consistency. You have to be consistent. 
and not to judge one another. Okay, hadith number five. On the authority of our mother, say the Aisha alayhi salam, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever innovates something in this matter of ours that is not of it will have it rejected. It's related by Bukhari and Muslim. In one version by Muslim, it reads, who, he who does not, who, sorry, he who does an act which our matter is not in agreement with will have it rejected. This is a very important hadith. All of them are important. But this hadith speaks to the, to the idea of bid'ah. What is an innovation? We know and we hear on Fridays when the khatib speaks, usually ends with the, or in the introduction of the khutbah, you know, he says, إِنَّ شَرُّ الْأُمُورِ لَمُحْدَثَاتُهَا فَكُلِّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلِّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ وَكُلِّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ Which comes from the hadith of how the Prophet used to begin his sermons. So all innovation, kul, you know, all innovation is misguidance and all misguidance is in the hellfire. This is the other half of that hadith. This is its other, its twin. So to understand what innovation means, you need this hadith, which is why this is what's included in this book, not the other statement. Because this is the, what, what uh, regulates or what defines what is accepted, an accepted innovation, and a non-accepted innovation. So the flip meaning of this hadith, that if you invent something, or if you innovate something in this matter of ours, in this deen that is from this religion, then it's accepted. It's the flip meaning. So therefore, innovated matters are of two kinds. Either something is accepted or something is rejected. What determines if it's accepted or if it's rejected? If it's linked to a principle of the faith. Laysa minhu. Not from the religion, meaning not from its principles. So for example, if I said, um, look, you know, we live in the West and five prayers are just too many. So we'll just pray twice a day. There's no... That's not from Islam. There's nothing that says that. You can't do that. We just read the hadith that the one of the pillars of Islam is prayer. And we talked about prayer and how if you deny it, you can be led out from Islam. But if I said, okay, the days in the summer are very long. Why don't we combine Dhuhr and Asr? And why don't we combine Maghrib and Asha? So we, pay the, we pray the five prayers in three times. Okay, this is from the religion because we have the dispensation the hadith of Ibn Abbas, it's narrated in Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ combined his prayers in Medina for no reason, meaning no reason for travel or no sickness. And this, by the way, is the Shia understanding of the five prayers. So the Shia pray the five prayers in these three times. So they see the afternoon time, Dhuhr and Asr, as one time. You can pray Dhuhr and Asr in either time and the same thing with Maghrib and Aisha, which is what we do when we travel. But in this case, there's a dispensation for non-traveling. In the case, the day is very long, uh, Maghrib is very late, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is something that is from the religion. If I say, uh, I finish my class, and I look at the clock, and you know, there's like 10 minutes before uh, the prayer time, and I say, why doesn't somebody read Quran and we listen? Okay, reading Quran, listening Quran is from the religion. So somebody can't say, oh, this is a bid'ah, meaning that this is something that is rejected. But if somebody comes and says, you know, the imam who leads the prayer, he has a very bad voice. Maybe, maybe if he could strum the prayer on the guitar. You know, he gets up, Allah Akbar, and he starts, sorry, no can do, right? There's nothing in our religion that allows that. Because the Quran has a way that it is recited. So on and so forth. So you can extrapolate on this, all of these things. So if something is based on the religion, its principles, its foundational principles, it's accepted. If it's not, it's rejected. So the people that call everything bid'ah, they don't know this hadith, even though it's, you know, Bukhari Muslim, Muttafaq alayhi, and it's in the collection of Mawi. It surprises me how they don't know this hadith because this is very essential. And there's another narration in Muslim. So it comes twice with different wording. Now, over Islamic history, there have been innovated things that we have inherited, that we forget our innovations. The most famous of these innovations is the Mus'haf, the Qur'an. 
the Quran was not written at the time of the revelation. I mean, it was written, but it was not collected in one volume. It was written on different parchments. It wasn't until the Khilafah of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that the Quran was brought together in one volume. And then in the Khilafah of Sayyidina Uthman, the, the script of the Quran was standardized. If you open any Mus'haf, it will say that this is written in accordance with the Uthmanic script, al rasm al Uthmani. The Taraweeh prayer of Ramadan. This did not happen at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This happened at the time of Sayyidina Umar. The Mihrab in the mosque where the Imam prays, that indentation, this is an innovation. Because by doing this innovation, you save a whole row. In this mosque, we don't have a, a mihrab, so we lose one whole row. right? Because the imam's got to stand here, and then everyone's got to be behind. So we lose an entire row. So the Muslims, they figure, oh, if we make a dent in the wall, you know, this little mihrab, and the imam prays there, we gained one whole row. So however long the mosque is, that's how many people. The rug in the mosque, this is also an innovation. There were no rugs in the mosque of the Prophet, Isa Salam. But this is considered cleaner and more beautiful, you know, things like that. So on and so forth. So there are things, the expansion of the mosque in Medina. The, the, after the passing of the Prophet, to Rafiq al-A'la, and as the community grew, the mosque was expanded in different stages. So when you go to Medina now, inshallah, may we all go, the mosque that you see, is, it's, the, that whole mosque was probably the entire city of Medina at the time of the Prophet. So it's been expanded. And then the mosques are designed and the Quran is, you know, if you open the Mus'haf, it's written in a certain way and it's, the pages are illuminated. All of these are innovations, but they were innovations that are based on the religion because when you open the Mus'haf, it's pleasing on the eyes. And uh, it preserved the, the written, the, 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 the act of writing the Mus'haf preserves the, the Mus'haf, preserves the Quran and preserving the Quran is something that is important, so on and so forth. So when we have, when we are presented with new matters, the key is, is this matter based on the principle, on a principle or multiple principles or not? That's how you determine if it's accepted. So all of the things that people think are bid'ah, like celebrating the birthday of the Prophet, like making dhikr, which is even, it's so funny even to say that somebody would actually consider that a bid'ah, but making the people say, doing the dhikr after the prayer, even though it's a sunnah, I mean, that's an established, it's not even a principle, that's an established sunnah. Um, making dhikr in a group, you know, many of the spiritual practices that people engage in, especially in the literature of tasawwuf, you find a lot of spiritual practices that are not necessarily based on strong hadith, but they're spiritual practices that encourage people to do good things. So we accept those things. Like we said in the beginning of the the series about the acceptance of the weak hadith, particularly in matters that encourage us to do good acts of worship. So all of these things, I would say almost all of the things that people commonly say are, are bid'ah, meaning a negative thing, are not. Why? Because they're all based on some principle. You name anything that people find quote-unquote controversial, now we call it controversial. It's not contra if, if If the People before us, if the ulama before us didn't debate it, it's not controversial. What people mean by it's controversial is I don't know the right answer. Is this something that's doable or not? So now we just say, we don't say it's bid'ah. Now the new way of saying it, it's controversial. Like somebody one time told me, you know, reading the, the poem, the Burda poem is controversial. It's a poem. How is it controversial? We studied poetry in school. We read Dick, Dickinson, um, Emily Dickinson and... Um, you know, uh, Shakespeare and Robert Frost and his poetry. Like, is that wrong? So that's okay, but reading the Burda that praises the Prophet is controversial, so on and so forth. So people that say this, now you know the answer to that. The answer is, is to ask the first question. Is this act based on a principle that exists? If it's, then it's accepted. If there's no principle, then it's not accepted. I think we could do one more. Oh, it's a big one. Okay. On the authority of uh, Abu Abdullah Nu'aim, the son of Bashir, may Allah be pleased with them both, who said, I heard the messenger of Allah Sallallahu say, that which is lawful is plain and that which is unlawful is plain between the two of them are doubtful matters about which not many people know. Thus, he who avoids doubtful matters clears himself in regard to his religion and his honor. But he who falls into doubtful matters falls into that which is unlawful, like the shepherd who pastors around a sanctuary all but grazing therein, 
Truly every king has a sanctuary and truly Allah's sanctuary is his prohibitions. Truly in the body there is a morsel of flesh, which if it be whole, the whole body is whole and which if it be diseased, all of it is diseased. Truly it is the heart. It is related by Bukhari and Muslim. Al-halal ubayin wal haram ubayin. So the halal and the haram are clear things, but there are gray matters. Most people don't know them, meaning that some people know them. وَالْرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Allah talks about the mutashabihat verses. لَا يَعْلَمُوا كَثِيرٌ وَالْرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ But those who are firm in knowledge, they have knowledge of those gray matters. And that's why Allah Ta'ala guides us and says, وَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people that know if you don't know. But if you don't have access to those people, and you think something is gray, then the default is to stay away from it in order not to fall into the haram. We call this in our ethical life al-wara. Al-wara is to be scrupulous, to caution, to, be, to take the path of caution. So somebody puts a drink in front of me. I'm in like a foreign country. I don't speak the language. And somebody puts a funny looking and funny smelling drink in front of me. I don't know, like if can I drink this or not? So in, I don't have anyone to ask. So in that case, I'm going to stay away from it. Maybe it's haram. So I'm going to stay away from it. There was this big uh, fitna in the 1920s, 1930s in Egypt that there was this rumor that the sugar that was being produced uh, had, uh, was it, some pig product was involved in the manufacturing of the sugar, which was not true. But there was this particular Sheikh Al Hafiz Al Tijani, Rahimahullah, uh, and he heard this, so he gave up sugar, completely. He said, "Ah, oh, because of this, I don't know. Maybe it's there's pork product." So after some time, it became clear that this was false information, you know, fake news. So his students came to him and they showed him, and he said, "Okay, that's fine," but they still noticed that he didn't take any sugar. So he said, why did you stop taking the sugar? Even though you know that it's, is it haram? He's like, no, but this is something that I left for the sake of Allah. So how can I go back to something I left for Allah's sake? So this is al-wara. This is being scrupulous and having a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a extreme example of something like that. The non-extreme example would be like, okay, you stop and then you find out that it's not haram. Then, okay, you can have it again. This idea of wara, this idea of, of being cautious, there's no end to how cautious you can be. So it's, it's something that, that is never ending. And it's important that you ask so that you don't put yourself in a situation that's ridiculous or you end up living you know, like a ridiculous life where you really don't do anything because you're scared that you might fall into the haram. But don't forget that the haram is clear and the halal is clear. So the things that are permissible and prohibited, those are very clear. But those matters that are gray, we ask. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said about the qalb, right? Ala wa inna fil mudra. Indeed, there is a morsel of flesh in the heart. This is like the remote control to your body. If this is good, everything else is going to be good. If this is bad, you're screwed. What is it? It's your heart. Meaning that the issue is not about the external. But the issue is about what's on the inside and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith, the Prophet he said, Inna li kulli shay'in siqala wa al dhikrullah. Everything has a polish, and the polish of the hearts is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did the Prophet say this? I mean, other than the fact that it's true, what's his what is he getting at? What he's getting at, and I think the hadith comes later in this collection, is that when we sin we get a black spot on our heart, our spiritual heart. And when we make tawbah, when we repent from that, that spot is removed. As a matter of fact, there's another hadith that says, when you sin, Allah commands the angels of recording the deeds to delay recording that sin for six hours. And the ulama understood that hadith to be literal, not metaphoric, meaning that you have a six, hour, six human hour window to make tawbah. And if you make tawbah from that sin, then it's never recorded in the first place. So Allah tilts things in our favor. So you, you sin, you get a black spot, 
You sin, you get a black spot, black spot, black spot, black spot, then your heart is black. You know, Allah calls it al-ghayn in the Quran. It's just, there's no light's going to get in or out. It's just encrusted with this. You can't see anything because of your own sins. But you sin and then you make tawbah. You sin and then you make tawbah. All the time, the Prophet ﷺ said, this is the best person. In Kulli ibn Adam khatta wa khayru al-khatta'in at-tawwabun. Everyone sins and the best of those who sin are those that constantly make tawbah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that he made istighfar a hundred times a day. You know, and where are we compared to the Prophet? I mean, he had no sins, sallallahu alayhi wa But his sins, quote unquote, were that every moment he was in a state of increase in his witnessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every moment he's closer to Allah, he makes tawbah from the state that was before that was less. It's a totally different concept of sin. We sin sin, like we do wrong things, you know. We backbite and we're arrogant and we lie and we steal and cheat, etc., etc., etc. We see the haram and we engage in the haram, etc. So these are the things that we need to make tawbah from. Why? Because in this hadith, the Prophet is telling us, if you do that and you protect your heart, the rest of your spiritual life will be corrected. You have a pure heart, it will lead you to, the, to a righteous life. If you have a blackened heart, it will lead you to that path that we spoke about a couple of hadiths ago, the path towards the hellfire. So tawbah, is an integral part of our, it's, it's one of the, the first principles of Islam, which is why this hadith is in here. This had, the, the part about the heart is linked with the halal and the haram and the gray area also to show us when you know that, now you have motivation to avoid those gray areas. I don't, don't, need, to, in, I don't need to risk it. So I'll just verify or I'm happy not doing it. You, so you're, you're, you, you naturally be cautious. Now people call us conservative. We, in this case, we are. We are conservative when it comes to these type of things for obvious reasons. So we want to verify and to make sure that our conduct is correct. Maghrib came in just now? Yeah? Okay. Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa'ala wa sallillahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.